welcome to the Optimalist Podcast. I'm Sarah, your host through this adventure about mindfulness, attention, focus, happiness, and motivation at a time when all of these things seem elusive and desired all at once. So how do we cultivate them? This week, I spoke with Kaylin Fullerton, a certified mindfulness meditation teacher who holds a master's degree in mindfulness for educators. She is a current doctoral student at Antioch University, studying educational and professional practice with a specialization in social-emotional learning. Kaylin has a background as a teacher in international schools in three different countries, and as an educational consultant, she works with schools, teachers, and families to support the development of mindfulness-based social-emotional learning for adults and children. Specifically, she provides professional development and change management support for systemic integration of mindfulness-based SEL into school communities. She currently lives in Jakarta with her partner and four bonus children. So, Kaylin and I had to record this episode pretty late in the evening in my time to accommodate for time zones. But I truly appreciated having the opportunity to speak with Kaylin again for the podcast, and my excitement might come through in the conversation a little bit. So listen as Kaylin and I talk about the importance of knowing ourselves, what elements go into nourishing a sense of belonging, and of course, mindfulness as the foundation for SEL. All this and more in my conversation with Kaylin. Have a listen. I still just think about that conversation and your your just dedication to helping students and families and teachers understand the meaning of mindfulness, not just in relation to SEL, but in our overall mental health as human beings. And I just want to like thank you for having that kind of an impact, um, even in, in the little corner of the universe that it probably doesn't seem like you're having an impact much beyond beyond where you are. Like that's how we all feel. But I do, I do just want to thank you for having that impact on me even because it makes me think a lot um, ever since we've talked. And of course, our conversation, like interacting with you on Twitter as well is, um, is quite enlightening. So I wanted to just kind of get an idea of what it is that has influenced your work. So from whether you want to think of it as your, your path, your career, your life, what it is that you study, what has influenced your path from the beginning until now? And what kind of is, is pushing the work that you do now? First off, thank you for that, because that's um, just lovely to hear. It was lovely to meet you as well and be connected. And, and that's the beautiful thing. Sometimes I think you, it's a love-hate relationship with social media, but Mm-hmm. I keep it because of those connections and, and those <laughs> little <laughs> strings you're kind of throwing across the world to people. So mm-hmm. I'm glad to be here a conversation with you. What is influencing my work and my path? It's a toughie. It, it, it is, right? <laughs> it, it, tell me your life. Tell me your it, life's it, journey now. One liner, <laughs> like, what is your purpose? Um, (laughs) that should be the name of this podcast actually right just what is your purpose (laughs) and then I just ask people that one question and they have 20 minutes (laughs) to like bumble through like oh I oh nobody's ever asked me that before Um, (laughs) (laughs) it's not a bad idea actually okay well I have actually been thinking about this and uh and and actually trying to articulate it and thinking about from when I started, you know, as a young child and and now and um, the direction I'm moving in. I think it's always been about in some way or some form nourishing this sense of belonging. And Whether that means um, belonging, self-belonging, or group, or kind of systemic-wide, it's been really about 
Yeah, I've always had this just kind of desire, I guess, to make a difference in my corner of the world. And you know, uh, <laughs> I was never a Girl Scout. <laughs> Leave it better than you came, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so I think that is the general purpose that's been driving me and is moving me down the path now. Yeah, I think that's a great um, a great way to think about it. Connecting. I'm thinking. I love that you just said nourishing a sense of belonging. And I'm wondering maybe we could explore that a little bit about the connection between, you know, because you're talking about specifically mindfulness, which is, I mean, one of my my main my main things every single day in my work. And so, how maybe we could think about how there's a connection between that individual sense of self awareness self-regulation, mindful, daily living, and and how that connects to a sense of belonging in a larger scale with other people, with your family, with the people that you work with. How does that individual sense lead to a connected um, group or systemic difference? Uh, That's a great question. And it's, I think, the necessary building block and Oftentimes we as humans, we want to move outwards. We don't want either, either we're scared and we don't want to focus on ourselves or in the other way, we think we shouldn't and, and we want to move outward first. But we need to know ourselves in order to be able to know how we best interact with the world. Um, we know ourselves and our emotions and our deepest needs and wants, you know, if we're true and honest with ourselves in those things, then we're going to be able to start to push that outwards as well and start to think about what other people might be wanting and and how their needs and wants might be different than ours and um and how that fits in, you know, the interconnected web of people and and uh, the, the environment but i think that this taking the time to be with yourself and to really understand how you work and to begin to cultivate that self-awareness and in that heart space as well the compassion um that's really the foundation for all sorts of relationships. Yeah. And I'm thinking about what really is our meta topic here, which is the mindfulness as the foundation for social emotional learning. And, you know, we think about, I mean, I think everybody has maybe slightly different ideas of what mindfulness is. I think we often too today also hear or see the word mindfulness and just kind of dismiss it because it becomes buzzword like a buzzword type of thing yes um you know i'm sure yeah i'm sure you're you're very aware of that and but if we really just just um think about the simplest meaning of it it really is the way that we become aware or understand both adults and children understanding emotions thoughts. um, And I think you even just mentioned the body. And I always think of it as the brain body connection, um, how inner, how your inner self affects your outer self. And I I guess probably the other way around as well. Right. And then I I probably then add the layer of how do you be mind, not only be mindful, but learn how to regulate um, yourself as an individual. And so how does that kind of play into the work that we, you know, how does that apply to the work that we do with schools and SEL? How do we make this something that is not just seen as a special thing that only certain people need? And I think that that is um, the conflict that we're seeing today, especially kind of post-pandemic when mental health seems to be an issue people want to address in schools. But just tacking SEL on is like this added thing, not really understanding what it means. I, I feel like you have this way of thinking about it as a mindfulness approach that is really helpful. There's there's so much in there to unpack. Um, 
I think first that with all wonderful things in life and in school, when you, it's a double-edged sword, right? I am so Uh happy and thankful that we are talking about mental health in schools. You know, and it, it, yeah, it took a worldwide global traumatic event for that to happen, really happen. Um, but, but we're talking about it. And at the same time, um, we want the quick fixes and we want, you know, we're, we panic and, and we see these epidemics happening and, we think, you know, what, what band-aid solution can I apply to that? And I think kind of what you're saying is that, you know, mindfulness starts becoming, you know, just this word that you see around and, and, you know, tell everybody to take a breath and you'll be fine. And, um, that's really not healthy. (laughs) And, um, and so, yeah, that we talk about mindfulness, we talk about SEL, social emotional learning. And, um, I think for a lot of overworked, um, trying their best burnt out teachers, it all seems like nice fluffy stuff. And it seems like one more thing that you add into your day that's already bursting at the seams. And, Mm -hmm. um, even though people might see the benefit, it's just like, how do I do this? And right. I heard once an SEL scholar say, uh, you know, SEL is not one more thing to put on the plate. It is the plate. Okay. Hmm. And, and so I want to add mindfulness in there. Because when we think of social emotional learning, it's this process, this developmental process, really, of, you know, developing your identity, being aware of your identity, understanding your emotions, understanding how to act in relationship, understanding how to make wise ethical decisions. And sometimes in some conversations, you know, mindfulness is thrown in there kind of as an element of the self-awareness aspect. But in the way I kind of fell into this practice, really, it was, um, it was a delightfully bumbling approach, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I kind of started with mindfulness and moved into SEL and actually realized how much you need that mindfulness as a foundation for the practice, because as you said, mindfulness is paying attention. It's understanding what's happening in your emotions and your body, um, Mm -hmm. and your thoughts. It's being able to intentionally cultivate states of compassion and care. And there's this conversation out there in the SEL field and, um, like I said, this worry that we're kind of just slapping it on as a Band-Aid or we're, um, you know, doing this one size fits all approach and potentially actually incurring harm if we're not um, being aware of students' different needs, if we're not being aware of our positionality, if we're not taking trauma into consideration. And so... I think mindfulness, this this kind attention, this deep awareness, having that as a foundation is what allows us to actually bring this program in in a holistic and equitable mm. way. And and by program, you know, I, I should say process, right? Um, yeah. And so, if you think about it, if you know, SEL, one of the big competencies is developing relationships, right? Well, you need to be able to pay attention to what's happening in your body and what emotions are coming up as you're having a conversation. If you want to be able to uh, be having a healthy conversation or developing skills in conflict management, right? If you 
mm-hmm. to be aware of your identity. You also need to be able to pay attention to what's happening, to what feels pleasant for you and um, what doesn't feel so pleasant and mm-hmm. what thoughts are coming into your head, what your patterns are. So that doesn't help with um, how to get it into schools <laughs> um, necessarily. Yeah, that's going to be, yeah. that's going to be my next uh, talk. <laughs> <laughs> but I think as a theoretical basis, I think that um, these two really need to be, you know, kind of linked together. Yes. And so yeah, it's almost like you read my <laughs> own, my own thoughts that are piling up as you're talking, because when we do talk about, actually, we can take a step even back further before thinking about getting it into schools precisely. But how do you go about, I guess, bringing adults up to speed with mindfulness as something that is like daily mindfulness as something that is an approachable way of life rather than something that is this huge change in their schedule or their time like you like you were mentioning before the way teachers might react to something being added to their workload or their class schedule that feels like extra if we just take teachers out of the picture for a second and even apply that same concept to all adults, how I think one of the reasons why people don't embrace it is because even just here, and it becomes a buzzword, is because we we hear it and we think it's either this huge thing and we don't know how to approach it, we don't know people who are doing it. We just associate it with like meditation and we don't you know, I might be someone that doesn't want to meditate for 30 minutes every day. So what does that mean? I Or we um, kind of really dumb it down to things that are that are not helpful at all. And so I think that the middle ground, like where is that approachable middle ground for for adults that kind of is a is a gateway? Because I think only then can we can we really think about teaching children and then integrating into schools well. Yes. Completely. Um, it starts with the adults. It starts with you, whether you're a teacher or a parent or, you know, just a person working in an office wanting to mm-hmm. have better relationships, right? Uh, right. Got to start with you. So I think you said it really well that when there's this big word and these buzzwords and you see it on books and, you know, you're hearing it around it does all all the misconceptions come along with it and i think what happens with mindfulness and with meditation is first off you get the misconceptions about it being a religious practice which, mm-hmm. you know it it if you are a religious person it can be added on it, there's a lot of um kind of spiritual traditions have similar mindfulness practices and meditation practices. And um, so it can definitely be part of that, but it doesn't have to be. There's a huge growing secular tradition that is backed by decades now of scientific research about the benefits for um, your brain, your physical health, your mental health, your relationships. So just knowing that and, you know, if you're a nerd like me looking up the you know, <laughs> reading all about it and finding out. Um, but if you're, you know, somebody who doesn't have that time in your day, not that I have that time, but um, <laughs> I think, again, also acknowledging that uh, this image of serenity, which is mm-hmm. lovely, but not realistic, um, this kind of, you know, like monk with a little smile on their face yeah. or, uh, you know, super toned fit woman sitting on a beach meditating uh, somewhere in a beautiful nondescript tropical place, right? Right. Uh, yeah. Those are the images that are associated in our society with mindfulness. And those 
don't really jive with what most of us are doing every day. And so I think we see that and we think, yeah, that's not for me, right? Or or I mm-hmm. can't attain that. And so like any sort of habit development, it's a practice. And mm-hmm. the the third, I wouldn't say this is a misconception, but this is what stops a lot of people in their tracks is, you know, you get your app, you download a guided meditation, you're like, this is going to be good for me. I've heard all these things, you know, I'm ready for it. I'm ready to try and I'm ready to clear my mind. And then you sit down and you get quiet and you're like, well, I'm a crazy person. Clearing the mind isn't for me. Um, I <laughs> like I, all that's happening is like, it's hard to sit still. Man, yeah. It's hard to sit still. I can't stop my thoughts. You know, my back hurts. There's, uh, you know, <laughs> all, all these things. And you're like, yeah, I guess I'm not a meditator, right? I can't be. My- yeah. And that is the statement that people, def- you know, they, they wind up deciding on, right? It's not for me. Of course. All the time. Yeah. And, and when I talk to people and I think this is the thing, I think it's beautiful that we have so many apps and so many resources out there. And if you just start by opening up a guided meditation and you don't have any kind of pre-awareness of um, what it might look like and it might feel like, you're going to get disappointed and disgruntled. And Mm -hmm. I can tell you that I've been meditating every day-ish for (laughs) <laughs> or, you know, almost 10 years and I've gotten to, you know, what you might call a, a happy place or a, you know, <laughs> nice, nice Zen place, like mm-hmm. a handful yep. of times. Like I am a type A, constantly moving, planning, um, incredibly overthinking person. And that's what pops up every time I sit down and meditate and what this practice is, it's not about clearing your mind, but it's just about recognizing what's there and being able to be more discerning and say, okay, you know, this thought is popping up. Do I want to follow it? Do I have to believe it? Do I want to create that story and go down that path? Or do I just want to kind of let it go and wait for the next thought to inevitably pop up? Yeah. I love how you're describing that because. Uh, I love everything that you're saying right now because it does make me think about um, like how you're how you're mentioning it. You know, it almost goes along with loving that people are taking the time to think about or it, you know make some sort of plans regarding mental health in schools and 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 other places. But at the same time, like you know, it's the same thing with the, with apps and stuff that you're talking about. It I don't know that it's the same thing as you know opening up an app and doing and jumping into 10 minutes of something that makes you feel at peace or gets you a little bit ready to rest before bedtime which i think a lot of people do they associate it with like calming down at night um and i think and if you did that the same time every night like i'm going to do 10 minutes of of this guided meditation before bed and that and i think it's it's great that people are aware of that and doing it but I don't know if it's the same thing, if it has the same effect on your like mind body connection and your ability to handle things that come your way and how you make decisions, like how you're, you know, the same way it would be if you integrated it throughout your day, because really mindfulness is awareness of the moment. Um, like how aware are you of, of the way you think about something or react to something when it happens or when someone's talking to you? Um, and you were saying this earlier in the conversation as well. Like, um, like, so to me, the practice of mindfulness has to be really dealt with in this way of how can we, how can we break it down into routines that help us become people who are able to recognize ourselves in every moment and, and actually savor, savor those like present the present awareness of each moment even if it's like no matter what it is that you're dealing with like being super present and i don't know that you know 10 minute 10 minutes of getting yourself just calmed down is the same thing 
Yeah, you make a good point. Uh, a, a lot of good points in there. And and I'm not sure, like, like 10 minutes of calming down before bedtime is wonderful. And if that fits in yeah. routine, that's... Hey, I do it too. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And, and I think you're right that, that again, another misconception is that mindfulness is not just about calming down. It's about right. cultivating that attention. And so mindfulness is not just meditation, right? But meditation mm -hmm. is, uh, is mindfulness. And I like to think of meditation as, you know, th the dress rehearsal for life, right? Because mm -hmm. ideally, we are being mindful in our everyday life. But even if we have the best intention to do that, without practice, it's, it's really hard. So yes, if we take, I mean, the thing is, especially if you're, if you're just beginning and, and you're thinking about this, five minutes, five minutes a day to, um, you know, just even set a timer and just sit and be there, noticing your breathing, noticing your thinking, noticing what sensations are coming up in the body. That's one that we as humans really don't spend enough time with. But taking that time, you know, it, it's like you have a quiet space, you have time to really be with yourself and cultivate this attention. And then if I do that every day for a week, for a month, for a year, if I'm noticing what thoughts are popping up, what emotions are coming up, then when I'm in the middle of my busy classroom and I didn't get enough sleep last night and, you know, there's five students calling my name at the same time, it, I start to be able to instead of lose it and yell at them, I start to be able to notice, okay, there's heat rising in my body and and I've got this clenching feeling and I'm mm -hmm. noticing frustration arising. What can I do in the moment, right? And mm -hmm. and so this, this practice, this habit formation of being able to sit quietly, or I'm going to say, um, if it doesn't get said often enough, some of us can sit quietly. You know, I've met a lot of people who, for whatever reason, either at the beginning or just, you know, all the time, it's not for them. You're just too wiggly. You just have to move around. So um, why not just doing some mindful walking, gently pacing? My partner feels um the most mindful when he's running mm -hmm. and you know and, and he incorporates with exercise it's different but if you are really first off having the intention to pay attention and just following that practice of every time um your attention wanders because it's going to hundreds of times just bringing it back to whatever it is you're initially paying attention to whether it's you know, the breath or a body sensation, or if you're walking or moving, the feeling of your feet on the ground. It's just that bringing back. And every time you're doing that, you are literally creating neural pathways in your brain. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And then, as you said before, the beautiful thing is you take that skill and you bring it into life. And I guarantee you will notice changes. It's amazing and pretty fascinating. Yes. And even as you're mentioning the, you know, feeling your feet on the earth and noticing all of that, like, especially hands and feet on the earth to me are a very, very big deal. Um, so even hearing you mention them, um, I'm like, oh, now I, I just want to go and practice. <laughs> <laughs> because I know what that I know what that feeling is. I can I can stand just in mountain pose for like ever, just thinking about my feet on the earth. Um, it's pretty pretty wild. Um, but it, it does. It has a tremendous effect on on the way you think and the way, like you said, it, it's like literally building 
new pathways. Um, so let's see, we only have a little bit of time left and I know we have a couple of things that I wanted to get to, but I'm like, like so many little, little side questions are popping up in my notes as I've sat here and was listening to you, but I'm, I'm trying to calm myself down <laughs> and realize I can't ask them all. Um, so Pay attention to that, 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 that coming in, right? Yeah, in the moment. <laughs> yeah, and so maybe I, I am, I'm gonna kind of transition towards what is the ending portion of this episode. But before I do, I wanted to know if you had any, um, any like I don't even want to say final words because it really isn't final. This is such a short snippet of what what I'm sure we could talk about. But maybe advice for people because most people listening to this, at least at this moment, are going to be educators. So, um, and they maybe have a variety of levels of experience with working with students in this way. So maybe, maybe just a little snippet of advice for people who are working in schools and interested in, in incorporating mindfulness in a, in an easier way than they think it has to be. That might be a good way to end this. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, First off, I think to all the educators is you're amazing. Mm -hmm. You are, you know, you are doing enough. You never think you are, but uh, you are. And what we've really been talking about and that frustrated me to no end as, as a teacher, as someone who just wants to bring all the wonderful things to my students is that you really got to try it for yourself first. You really have to try to embed yourself in these practices and know what paying attention feels like. Know how to be able to sense joy, sense anger, sense anxiety in your own body, right? Mm -hmm. And know how to decipher your needs and how to communicate them, you know, try, try to find different ways to do that. Because when you are actually experiencing these mindfulness based SEL practices for yourself, it shows to your students. Yeah. In ways that we can measure in ways that just show up in the classroom dynamic, in ways that, you know, emotions are contagious and we pass this on and in, in, into our classroom. So the first thing I would say is, yes, bring these practices into your classroom, but but just hold, just give yourself that time and that grace to explore a little bit and experiment a little bit on your own and become familiar and get these ideas into your body. And even doing that, even, even you know, before trying and experimenting with students, if you are getting things into you, that's going to show up. That's going to make a difference. Yeah, I love that, and it, it's it really is the the key. I think to, uh, I mean, just like anything you introduce to students, I think they they know whether or not you're being authentic, especially if it's super new and kind of not something they think about every day. But they know when you're being authentically a part of it with them and sharing the experience with them. And I think that goes back to some of the sense of belonging and connectivity you brought up at the beginning of our conversation in um, kind of what has fueled you or propelled you forward on on this journey of of connecting mindfulness and SEL together. Um, and when we think of it as bringing parents in or any adult and then a school community and teachers, like, and that kind of just blossoms outward, right? And then you see how communities of connected, mindful individuals can be cultivated. And that to me is really the picture of serenity. That's the beautiful 
right? That's the beautiful. Magical, of- isn't it? Yeah. It is to think about that. Um, I, that this kind of that kind of thing is what that's co- making my body feel like a calmed sense of peace right now when I think of what it would what it's like to actually witness people experiencing those changes. It's um, that's where the magic is, and I I want so badly for more and more people to to be witness to that and feel it themselves, which is exactly what you're what you're communicating as well. And so um, I want to. I want to kind of transition into a couple of things here for the end of ending, ending pieces of this episode. We've been trying out a little, this, we're, you're only, I think this is going to be episode four. So we're still way at the beginning of the Optimal Ads podcast, but we're trying out these little pieces at the end where we kind of get into people's heads in a little bit of a different way to see if some things that they are, are, you know, that our guests are consuming or enjoying maybe have a connect not that it has to but i love to see how the things that people bring into their brains or ears um are are kind of a bigger picture of what it is that that they that they do and it's like a fuller picture of yourself so with that being said what kaylin are you reading watching listening to um at this moment you can you can list all of them you can talk about one or two um, but we'd love to get a sense of just who you are um, adjacent to your work in mindfulness. Mm, awesome. Love the full picture. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> so un- until yesterday, um, I was like, hmm, well, I'm a graduate student. And so I'm reading about qualitative research. And <laughs> I was like, <laughs> How to conduct a cooperative inquiry, um, which is super exciting for me right now. Uh, totally nerding out, but I love reading fiction. It's funny, like I I love learning and um, am constantly like consuming things about um, mindfulness and SEL and systems and you know leadership in the world, but. I can sit down and like finish a interesting fictional story in a day, whereas the nonfiction takes me a lot longer. Um, Me too. Fiction is the best, right? Yep. (laughs) And 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 it's it's the best for you know being human, really. I think so. I was really excited because I a book that I'd had on hold popped up yesterday, so I started reading. It's called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. I know that book. You know that <laughs> one? I, I, it was on all the lists. So I'd had it mm-hmm. on hold at the library for a while. And yeah, I'm, I'd say I'm about maybe a quarter in. But um, so far, it seems like it's a story of friendship. And I'm finding a lot of through lines about empathy in mm. there. Um, and empathy through... Uh, the the act of creating it's it's about people you know it's it's about many things but people creating a game a video game together mm-hmm. and um so this idea and I love when you find things that you didn't think about like that uh, to create a video game and to play a video game is is really an act of empathy of interesting you know, yeah, yeah developing perspective and um getting into somebody else's shoes and thinking mm. about how you know who might play and how they might play and what their needs might be so uh i am yeah have you read it i haven't but i i had seen a couple i follow a lot of writers on twitter and i had seen people tweeting about it recently and i can't remember why i think there must have been some event going on that people were at um but but there was like a an uptick in tweets about it or reviews about it recently. Um, so I was a, I'm aware of that, that there are some kind of following. And it could be, you know, you're saying that it was on hold for a while. That could be there's some kind of demand. Definitely. Yeah, going yeah. on for that. Cool. And that's very interesting what you just said about video games and empathy. I hadn't really thought about that. And I'm, sh- I'm sure a lot of our listeners do have thought about that. Um, so that that's kind of cool. Um, so what about watching, listening? Yes. Um, what am I? So right now, uh, we're watching a show on Netflix called Travelers. 
hmm. which I saw on a list of um, interesting sci-fi shows. So it's, I, I don't want to spoil anything, but oh, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> kind of a, you know, a future present connection. There's, mm. you know, um, basically people come back from the future and are living in the 21st century. And what I think is really interesting, it's about AI as well. And it's about trying to change, you know, the present to make a better future. Mm. Um, but what I love about that one is that this small, like nuanced interactions and the, the way the, you know, the people come back from a future that's pretty desolate. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> uh, and, um, but the, the way they interact with, um, different things that we take for granted, I think. And yeah. it, our normal life, you know, take out food and, and just different kinds of food in general and even human relationships um, mm -hmm. and uh, ways of connection. So there's lots of little things that make me chuckle. And it's also it was a little, <laughs> a little slow getting into, but um, but I'm now hooked and I'm enjoying it. Yeah. So it's a good one. I recommend if you're a sci fi fan. <laughs> Okay. And okay. So I have been listening. I have a lot of, uh, just kind of lo-fi classical music on in the background because I'm doing a lot of writing for school lately. But when I am, you know, blasting my shower music, it's <laughs> been the Spotify all out nineties playlist. Nice. Uh, which, yeah, seems to be like, a lot of, you know, female singer songwriters, Alanis and Sarah McLaughlin and mm -hmm. Jewel. <laughs> and uh, I hope some Lisa Loeb is in there as well. Oh, yeah. You know that. Oh, my gosh. It's one of my yeah. favorite, my favorite car and shower um, listens is Lisa. Yeah. So uh, lots of fun there. <laughs> mm, well, I might be putting that on like immediately after we're done. Highly <laughs> recommend. That's good for any occasion. Awesome. The last question I, I always, I have to figure out a better transition for this, everybody. So if anyone listening has, has ideas for me, please give me hints on how to do anything better than I, that I am doing right now. But my last question is kind of totally unrelated to talking about things that you're listening to and stuff. But um, we like to end by bringing the focus back to attention. So I would like to ask you, what is a method for focusing or improving your attention that you find actually works? Can I say mindfulness meditation? <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. It's almost like it's almost like you know what's going to come next, Kaylin. It's like, <laughs> is it too obvious? Should I have? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I I think you know. Just go back and listen to 20 minutes ago when I talked about habit habit formation. Yeah. But um be yes, being able to take that time to practice paying attention because it is a skill. It's something, you know, our teachers all kind of yelled at us when we were kids, right? Pay mm -hmm. attention. But now we're finally starting to realize that we need to practice it. So um having that daily habit does help me to pay more attention uh, in the moment when things are crazy. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I love that you just said paying attention to skill because I'm always repeating, or we all do here at, at Optimalist and with Focusable, we're always saying focus is a skill um, and that everybody is actually focusable. We just forget that we have the ability to change our own behavior and to change the way we think about attention. We forget that we have that in us because we're so used to being told that we're the most distracted generation of people, which we are, but we we have the ability to cultivate that awareness. And I think that's what we're all, I mean, at least you and I in this conversation are here for, right? To help, <laughs> help people. <laughs> help people pay better attention. Um, hey, if you're listening right now and you also want to help everyone pay better attention, please tell me on Twitter. Please tweet right now. 
Um, we'll see if that works when this episode comes out. So we're gonna we're gonna stop giggling um, for a minute because the real <laughs> the real actually you know what let's let's share where people can find you first and then the real end to this episode is going to be. Kaylin leading us in a short mindfulness meditation. And I think that'll be a great way um, to bring everything into a close. But before we do that, where can people find you if they want to get in contact with you, say hi, and, or any any links to work that you're doing or things you'd like people to visit? Um, and we'll put, we'll put all of those in the show notes too. But why don't you um, just kind of let people know? Yes, please do. And like I said, uh, that's how you and I met is mm-hmm. just random twittering. So uh, I do don't hesitate to reach out. So on Twitter and LinkedIn, uh, my handle is Kful, K-A-I-F-U-L-L. And I also have a new business called Upstream Collaborative, which is trying to do this work, bringing mindfulness-based SEL to teachers, to kids, to schools. So uh, please do reach out if you are journeying on this practice and you have any questions or you're just excited about these kinds of things. <laughs> um, <laughs> just, uh, yeah, love to chat. So, And if you want to talk about the 90s with Kaylin, she's totally down with that too. <laughs> that, yes, it doesn't have to be mindfulness. <laughs> it can be 90s. <laughs> mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here with me tonight, Kaylin. And for me, it's the night. For you, it's the morning. So <laughs> it, it's a flip flopped world. Um, and I think we'll, um, whenever you're ready, I think we'll, we'll lead into a little meditation. So I think since we've talked about it a little bit, I'll, I'll lead a body based practice. So just wherever you are. Whether you are sitting, whether you're lying down, whether you are, you know, standing proudly in mountain pose, uh, just get comfortable. As, you know, you don't need to be sitting cross-legged um, like a monk. You can be, you know, just paying attention to what your body needs right now. Trying at least where you are to kind of have a almost a regal posture, finding um, an uprightness. It's sorry, I feel weird saying that, even if you're lying <laughs> down. <laughs> just a just a line from your belly to the top of your head, so you can imagine as the breath is entering your body, it's it's. Um, uninhibited, it's entering in a free way. And just taking a minute to settle in and maybe take a few deeper breaths if that feels comfortable for you. Just allowing yourself to notice the breath moving into the body. Maybe paying attention to the rise and fall of your chest or to your belly moving up and down with each breath. Allowing your breath to come back just to normal pacing not forcing anything, not efforting, just letting it be. And now just take a minute to kind of scan your body, starting at the top of your head, and gently working your way down with an attitude of curiosity, asking, what's happening here? What do I notice? Really looking out for any places that you might be holding tension. 
and checking in with yourself to see if you find that place. Most of us will. Is it possible to soften? Noticing, you know, that space kind of behind your face. Creases in your eyes, your jaw. This is a place sometimes we hold tension. Your neck and your shoulders. Sometimes they're up around our ears and we don't even realize it. Just checking in with your body and seeing, can I soften? Can I allow some ease into this space? Being prepared that sometimes the answer is no, and that's okay. But if the answer is yes, let that softness in. Maybe staying for a minute or two to feel the breath in that part of your body. Letting it kind of wash out that old stuck energy. Continuing to allow your attention to move down and through your body. Noticing places again of tightness, of tensing. Is it possible to put down that burden, just let it be? Recognizing also that for most of us, as we're doing this practice, we're going to find our mind wandering and getting distracted. And just be with that. As soon as you notice, oh, I'm not in my body anymore. I'm in tonight's dinner or tomorrow's lesson plans. Celebrate that you're noticing this. This is a moment of mindfulness. It's time to bring your attention back in. And now being here in this body, wherever you are, just take a minute to ground into some body sensations. This is a practice you can do on the go when you're standing in the middle of a group of children or you're walking down a busy road or you're sitting and you're feeling a moment of stress. Being able to come and be in our bodies helps us to feel more grounded, to feel more present. So I invite you to just bring your attention into your feet. Perhaps for some of you, they're planted firmly on the floor. Perhaps they might be touching a different part of your body, the chair or your thighs. Just notice what it feels like in your feet right now. What sensations? Perhaps there's temperature, warmth, or cold. Maybe there's a pressing or a pushing sensation. Perhaps there's even tingling or tension. Just name that sensation. There's nothing bad or good about what feeling you're feeling just is.
and trying to pay attention to the connection between your feet and whatever solidness is holding them up. Sometimes we get so caught up in our brains and our thoughts and our thinking that our connection to the earth, to the present, can get lost. It can feel a little murky. Most of the times our feet are planted or we can choose to plant them. Just feeling that connection with something solid, knowing that you're supported, you're held. You have a connection to the earth, to physical presence. Allowing your attention to root there. Knowing that again, anytime you're in the middle of a busy, chaotic moment, you can take 10 seconds to breathe and ground into your physical presence. This is here for you always. So gently, staying rooted, staying grounded, but allowing your breath to deepen again. Allowing it to wash through you. And as you feel ready, bringing your attention back to the space around you, opening your eyes if you closed your eyes during this practice, coming back to your day. Well, you just transported me. <laughs> that was beautiful, Kaylin. Thank you so much. I hope um, everybody was able to undone like I can't even speak I got so <laughs> can hear my voice um I hope everybody was able to use that um practice at any point in their day um maybe what we'll do is we'll even kind of um snip it from this episode we'll keep it here but also maybe offer it as a little bonus that people can use yeah that would be okay. great um well now that Sarah's nice and uh <laughs> Come and can't speak. When you're 10 minutes before, <laughs> so I should end every episode with me sounding like I'm about to pass out. <laughs> um, thanks again, Kaylin, and I can't wait to talk to you again soon. So good chatting with you, Sarah. Thanks for listening to episode four. Eternally grateful to Kaylin for sharing her knowledge and advice and energy today and also for lending her voice at the end there for a beautiful example of a mindful meditation that you can practice right along with us. Of course, I'm eager for your feedback and reactions. It's the best way to help the podcast grow in its purpose and for us to keep getting better and better. You can leave a comment on Substack, a review in Apple Podcasts, and you can reach me on Twitter at scandela9. You can also listen and subscribe to The Optimalist Podcast wherever you love listening to great podcasts. New episodes are released every Wednesday. Links to all of these resources are available in the show notes. The Optimalist Podcast is brought to you by Focusable, the only app that gives you the pulse you need for better attention. And it's free. Create an account today at getfocusable.com or by downloading Focusable on any iOS or Android device. You can also follow us at Get Focusable on Twitter and Instagram. Thanks for listening to The Optimalist, and I'll see you next week. Stay focused.